Hi everyone, welcome to the Earth Science Regents Review podcast series created by Homics Middle School Earth Science Department. Today we're going to be talking about Earth's history. Now with Earth's history, we're dealing with such a huge amount of time. We're dealing with about four and a half billion years. We need to take that time and break it up into smaller units called eons, eras, periods, and epochs. Now realize when one of these time units ends and the other one begins, it's usually based upon an extinction, an appearance, or maybe a, some sort of geologic event that might have taken place like the breakup of Pangaea. So realize when we're dealing with these, some of these time units are going to be multiple millions of years old and there isn't a major event that causes one of them to end and another one to begin. The biggest unit of time is an eon. That's going to be the largest unit of time. You have two of them, the Precambrian and the Phanerozoic. The Precambrian is actually big enough that it has to be broken up into two sub-eons called the Archean and the Proterozoic. And that's very simply because the Precambrian makes up about 85% of Earth's history. Eons are broken up into eras. Second largest unit of time, you have four of them, the Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And again, there's just a lot, too much to list in this podcast, but the Paleozoic itself is important because that's when oxygen really built up in the atmosphere. Errors are broken up into periods. These are probably the most popular unit of time on the Regents exam, and there's way too many to list, but make sure you look at page 8 and 9 in the reference table. The Cambrian, the Triassic, and the Quaternary are just some of the more popular ones. Periods now are broken up into epochs, and epochs are the smallest unit of time. Again, take a look at page 8 and 9 in the reference table. The Pleistocene is going to be very important because that was the last ice age to occur. Now you can't talk about Earth's history without talking about Earth's atmosphere. And Earth's atmosphere three billion years ago is very different from what it is today because of the outgassing or the volcanic eruptions that took place. So many noxious gases were put into the atmosphere that organisms were really what we call anaerobic in nature. Because oxygen was missing, that was one of the key ingredients that was missing, there wasn't enough in the atmosphere, anaerobic organisms dominated the planet. They did not use oxygen. Well, then how did oxygen build up in the atmosphere? And it all came from a type of algae called the stromatolite. Basically, stromatolites used the noxious gases in the atmosphere as a food source and created oxygen as a waste product. And a couple billion years of this happening, it built up enough to where organisms start to evolve and they were aerobic in nature. Aerobic organisms mean that they do use oxygen as a food source. So there's an actual photograph of a current day living stromatolite, one of the oldest species on the planet. And there's a fossilized stromatolite in Leicester Park in the Adirondack Mountains. Well, all of this oxygen had to lead to something. And basically, the big event that scientists point to is what we call the Cambrian Explosion. And this is a time period where a massive diversity of animals evolved on the planet. The Cambrian time period is the first period in the Paleozoic era. And it was all due to the fact that you had a massive abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere. And the, probably the best fossil evidence of the Cayman Explosion takes place in what we call the Burgess Shale. The Burgess Shale is a type of shale that's found in British Columbia. And there's one of the organisms that can be found in the Burgess Shale. Well, when we talk about species diversity, we have to realize that as time goes on, species have become more diverse. They've become more complex as well. But you have to realize that most species on the planet that have ever lived on the planet have become extinct. Very few have lasted the test of time. And a lot of this idea has to be linked to the studies of Charles Darwin. And basically, Darwin just basically stated what we call survival of the fittest. Those organisms that are really strong will survive the length of time. Now, these pictures of fossils are not really given to you in any specific order, but realize that some of these fossils are more complex than others. Very simply because of probably when they exactly existed. Some of the more simple fossils that you're looking at here existed in much earlier time. The more complex fossils lived much closer to current time. There's a megalodon tooth. Megalodon lived pretty close to current time. Plesiosaur was one of your dinosaurs. One of your raptors. Obviously T-Rex. So you see some of these pictures are much more complex and that's linked all the way back to what we call Charles Darwin. Okay, Darwin really, really did a tremendous uh, number of studies on what he considered the theory of organic evolution, which basically stated that only the strong survive, or another way to say is the survival of the fittest. 
Organisms that have really strong genes will survive the test of time. Organisms that don't have very strong genes will be uh, will tend to die off in what we call extinctions. So you get extinctions and appearances of species as time goes on. So with the extinction of the dinosaurs, especially, it's probably the most widely studied extinction event. We believe 65 million years ago, an asteroid or meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula about 65 million years ago. Uh, because of the uh, severity of the impact, there was so much dust put up in the atmosphere that the sun was blocked, dropping global temperatures. And the evidence of this impact is a very important element called iridium that's only found in space objects. We can find a very, very thin layer of this literally covering the entire planet uh, that dates back to about 65 million years ago. Well, when we talk about fossils, there's one specific type of fossil that's very important. They're called index fossils because they make what's called a very good time marker. These things have to live over a huge geographic area and have to live for a relatively short period of time. Now, index fossils are going to be fossils that are going to be found in one distinct layer of rock. So you can see here that the trilobite at the bottom is only found in one distinct layer of rock, that siltstone, but it's found in all four locations. Same thing with these letters. The letter C is going to be representing your index fossil, very simply because of the fact it's found in one distinct layer of sandstone and it's found in all three locations. Volcanic ash is also a very, very good time marker as well, very simply because of the fact that it's distributed over a very, very big geographic area and it deposits for a relatively short period of time. So volcanic ash and index fossils are very, very good time markers. So the big thing here is that we use both correlation, uh, we both use your index fossils and your volcanic ash to correlate rocks. Correlation just means to match up your rock layers. So scientists do what's called walking the outcrop. They look for clues in the rock to help match them up to try to figure out if they're going to be the, very similar in age. So you see this road cut here. You see that layer of sandstone right there in the, sec in this, in the uh, two sections really match up nicely. So here, basically what you're going to look at is rock type your limestones, your sandstones, and you just try to go in order. Siltstones, shales, your limestones, your conglomerates, your sandstones. Okay, they're all going to match up. What this can also help you do is not only help you match up rock types in specific order, but you can now tell the oldest and youngest rock layer. The rock layer at the bottom of outcrop B is the oldest. The rock layer at the top of outcrop A is going to be the youngest. So when you put them in order like this, you can see from oldest to youngest. So with that being said, that's it for Earth's history. We'll talk to you soon.